Uh, good afternoon. Welcome once again to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. We are delighted to have you uh, join us uh, today. Um, before we kick things off, I uh, just want to remind you, as always, uh, look to the right of your screen um, for your chat box. Um, please, uh, during the presentation, feel free to pose questions. Um, and We usually wait to the end uh, to address uh, them during the Q&A session. Um, before we get started today, I'm going to um, call on my colleague, once again, Beth Thompson, to open us up in a word of prayer. In, uh, to address, Dear God, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity um, to come um, and learn. learn. Father, I just pray that you would uh, go before us. Thank you for Dr. Lane and his knowledge, Lord. I uh, just pray that uh, you would communicate effectively and that this would be just a time of uh, learning and learning, and learning and one and of us and that we would glorify and everything we do today. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, Beth. Um, so uh, today, um, again, delighted to um, partner uh, with uh, our good friends uh, at Liberty University. I um, want to introduce Dr. Richard Lane. He's no stranger to the forum. Dr. Lane is the director uh, of the Master of Public Health program at Liber Liberty University, of course, in uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, um, where he has served for nearly a quarter of a century as a university's campus physician, as well as the team doctor for their athletic programs. Uh, Dr. Lane earned his MD uh, degree uh, from the University of Maryland. Uh, before being called into active duty with the U.S. Uh, Air Force as a flight surgeon. Uh, he later uh, earned a degree uh, or a master's in public health and tropical medicine from Tulane University uh, and then completed a fellowship in aerospace medicine at the United States Air Force uh, School of Aerospace Medicine. Um, he is board certified uh, in aerospace medicine, uh, a fellow of the American uh, College of Preventative Medicine, and a member of the American uh, Public Health uh, uh, Association. So as you can tell, he is uh, quite qualified uh, to speak to us today. Uh, today, um, he is going to be presenting primary health care uh, and emerging uh, infectious diseases. So Dr. Lane, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you very much, Lance. Uh, before I begin, I actually wanna give kudos to Dr. Colleen Kraft for the excellent presentation she did just a, a month or so ago. Uh, because I think laboratory is vital to understanding the epidemiology. Um, but I think both Lance and I kind of forgot that I was going to be doing something on emerging diseases as well. And he called me and he apologized up and down. And I, I thought about it, prayed about it. Do I change directions? Where do I go? Um, and as I prayed, I thought, why not take a different angle and talk about primary health care? Uh, in fact, I'm actually doing this presentation in the middle of my primary health care course. Uh, and in developing countries, you usually don't have the technologies and the lab and the resources. And so I, I want to kind of look at it from that angle, uh, because I think we are at the forefront and really important that we recognize emerging diseases. And so I'm going to take you back uh, to 1918, uh, 19, Kansas, uh, here in the United States. And... Um, at that point in time, imagine that you're in rural Kansas, uh, you don't have laboratory facilities, and a particularly virulent influenza outbreak occurs. Um, and so at this point, we hadn't even identified what a virus was. Uh, we'd recognized the filterable pathogen in tobacco back in uh, 1892, and the term virus was first coined in, in 1898, but it really wasn't until 1931 that we were able to isolate these things. So we've come quite a long way since that time. Uh, and of course, if you are a historian at all, any sort of infectious disease, you realize that in Kansas in 1918 was when we first began to see the Spanish influenza. It was actually a misnomer. Uh, it, according to our nomenclature standards, we should be calling it the Kansas influenza. Uh, but we were at war and nobody wanted to report that it was out there. So it was the first major emerging disease of the 20th century. Uh, and so what I want to really want to point out is emerging diseases aren't new. Um, in fact, in ancient Athens, 400 years before the birth of Christ, there was an emerging disease uh, that wiped out a whole population in Athens. And so this is how one reporter in uh, very... Um, reports it in The Great Influenza, written in 2004. He says, the disease overwhelmed Dr. Loring Minor with patients. He put everything else aside, slept sometimes in his buggy while the horse made its own way home. He wondered if he was being confronted with the plague of Athens. 
mysterious infection that devastated the city during the uh, Peloponnesian Wars, killing possibly a third of the population. Then the disease disappeared. And that often happens with emerging diseases. In fact, I think Lance can attest to how suddenly you can become overwhelmed and uh, concerned about emerging diseases, particularly with his experience with Ebola. So what is an emerging disease? And here's an important definition, stomp your foot three times. Uh, you'll see this again a little bit later if you're getting CME credit. Um, an infectious disease whose incidence in humans has increased in the past de two decades or threatens to increase in a near future is defined as emerging. Uh, and this might include new infections, uh, but they don't necessarily have to be, um, you know, because we do get evolution of existing pathogens. They change a little bit. Uh, we see that with flu all the time. It could be the spread of known agents to new geographic areas or populations. And that certainly happened during the bubonic plague in Europe uh, a few hundred uh, years ago. Uh, it could be previously unrecognized infections in areas undergoing ecological transition or transformation. And we're, we're seeing some of that going on right now with many of these new viruses that uh, we are just beginning to understand. And it could be old infections reemerging as a result of antimicrobial resistance uh, of known agents. Uh, for example, MRSA has been a real problem and the breakdown of our public health measures uh, certainly contributes to that. So I'll move on to the next slide. And here's a photo of somebody we know and love. Uh, and we'll, we'll start with Ebola a little bit here. On the right of the photo is uh, Dr. Malanga, an African MD from Congo. Uh, of course, we're thinking back in 76, it was actually Zaire. And he was sent as one of the providers into the original outbreak of Ebola back in uh, 76. Uh, this hemorrhagic fever at that time was unknown. Um, and of course, on the left, we have Lance, and I had the privilege of introducing these two fellows uh, a couple years ago at a conference uh, up in DC, or actually I was in Baltimore, I believe. Um, and we've actually been since Dr. Malanga's day through 19 different outbreaks of Ebola involving five different uh, strains of Ebola viruses. In 1976, I was still a college student. In fact, I was busily involved in promoting swine flu vaccination programs in Maryland and in the process of applying to medical school. And a good friend of mine, a Catholic missionary, was posted to Zaire during that time. Uh, she was working with nuns on human rights issues. And because many of the nurses in her mission were um, nurses, uh, these nuns, um, when Ebola rose, they were transferred out to help with the crisis. Unfortunately, a lot of them never returned. They picked up Ebola and they died as a consequence. Uh, she eventually returned to the US and is uh, up in DC now, uh, but she was quarantined for nearly two months, as she recalls, uh, for fear that she might harbor the virus in some way, despite lack of exposure. Uh, when Ebola reemerged in West Africa in 2013 and on into uh, 2014, many health providers, in fact, wanted to dismiss the virus as something other than Ebola. In fact, they labeled it as this must be loss of fever. And Lance can attest that some of them lost their lives because of their carelessness. Uh, the index of suspicion really has to remain high uh, so that proper public health response can be mounted. And as I think about community health worker programs uh, where we're taking people who have fairly low educational status, and we have to think about their role in surveillance and how to make sure they know when to use proper PPE um, and should those needs, needs ever arise. Uh, the three students I actually have in the room with me are learning about how to set up those community health worker programs. So this is why I decided this would be a good topic. Next slide. Um, December 2015, so we're a year into the Ebola crisis. And because of that, uh, the World Health Organization realized that we really needed to have a better handle on emerging disease. And so they set up to identify the five to 10 diseases uh, that had the greatest potential for future outbreaks and to direct our research focus on those needs. Uh, the priority ranking relates basically to the seriousness of the condition, the potential for spread, and the list, of course, is going to expand as new threats are detected. Uh, and as we shift our focus from prevention to curative measures, and as we establish 
ways to cure these diseases, or at least to treat them more effectively, then we can reevaluate. Um, this list has grown. Uh, initially, there were eight priority diseases. Um, and each year, as we've reevaluated this, we've added. So in 2016, we added three more diseases. So the list is up to 11, uh, which is now outside our parameters of five to 10 critical diseases. Um, and as we look at it this year in December, we will probably add more diseases to that. Now, you're, as I present this list, I want you to understand that there are some things that are serious agents that we know are there, like HIV AIDS. I, I remember my first case of AIDS uh, as a medical, well, actually, I think I was an intern at the time, uh, in the early uh, 80s. I got a call from an ENT surgeon. He was concerned about this purplish rash and uh, called me because I was on the service for dermatology. He says, can you take a look at rash? I said, sure, I'll run right down there. Uh, what does it look like? And he described this purple rash. My next question is, well, why were you seeing the patient? And he said, well, I had systemic uh, esophagitis from candidiasis. And I said, were you wearing gloves? And his question to me was, should I have been? Um, not the right answer. Fortunately, he did not come down with HIV, but I want you to remember that back in the early 80s, we had no test. We still had not identified the virus. We know so much more now. Um, malaria certainly emerges periodically in certain areas, but we know how to treat that. Avian influenza, and I'll have another slide later on that uh, particular topic, dengue. All those diseases were not included on this list because even though they're important diseases, uh, there are major disease control mechanisms and research networks to deal with those infections. And so they just weren't a priority for more. As with Dr. Minor, it's up to primary health care provider, no matter what level, to recognize an emerging disease. And so if you're going to have to respond, you need to know what you're up against. So here's the initial list. Um, and I'll come back to this list periodically. Uh, first glance, notice the top four are easily identified as hemorrhagic fevers. Those things scare us to death, uh, as they should. Um, you know, I've seen loss. I have not dealt personally with Ebola. Um, I've dealt with the counseling, though. One of our students uh, had a sister that died of Ebola and uh, came to our program because of his dealing with that particular disease and the impact it had on his community in Liberia. Um, but each of these diseases has very unique epidemiologies. And you have to understand the epidemiology of each so you can better anticipate and prevent the situations where an outbreak may occur. Uh, the next two diseases are coronaviruses. Uh, realize the common cold is also a coronavirus. Uh, very easy to transmit through the air. It's a respiratory syndrome primarily. Um, and we continue to see small outbreaks of this. And then the other two diseases are things you may or may not be familiar with. The Nipah and Rift Valley fever, uh, certainly important diseases. So moving down to the next slide. Um, so these are the three that have been added, a chikungunya, uh, severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome, and Zika. And these were added. Um, and I'd like to point out that uh, these are arboviruses. And I'm very concerned with the situation in Texas and Florida and the Caribbean. Hurricanes produced a lot of flooding in the last few weeks and ripe environments for 80s mosquitoes. And with diseases on the original list, uh, environmental factors could be an issue. Um, they're all zoonotic infections. It's not uncommon for them to make a jump to a human host when conditions favor um, the interaction between animals and humans. Natural disasters, of course, favor that. And natural disasters, particularly with flooding, favor the growth of the mosquito vectors uh, for the arboviruses. So Zika and chikungunya are really going to be on my radar in the next few weeks and months. Um, you know, what would we do with those? And this is nothing new. And in fact, uh, scripture very clearly points out nothing's new under the sun. Uh, before the time of Solomon, we had perfect environment. But think about as thorns and thistles arrived uh, to the scene, their growth certainly affected the lifestyle of the world and they created the environmental conditions that were ripe for uh, Cain to then kill Abel. So consider the plagues of uh, Exodus 9. 
Uh, number five, the pestilence of livestock. And number six, the boils of the animals and the man. Are those just zoonoses that God orchestrated in that particular situation? And perhaps uh, even from the Garden of Eden, things were set into motion to allow those diseases to arise. Okay, so moving on here. Let's look again at our list. Add it on the three, so it's now up to 11. Uh, and it will get longer. And I, I want to point out that as I talk, I'm probably going to raise more questions than answers. And in fact, this list of diseases are here because we don't have all the answers um, and we need to get them. So let's see if we can break down these diseases and go through them one at a time in just a brief overview. And so we're going to go ahead and relump them a little bit. And we'll look first at the hemorrhagic fevers. And I think we all agree these are terrifying. And in addition to these four diseases, two others on the list, Rift Valley fever and severe thrombocytopenia with fever, can cause hemorrhagic symptoms. Um, of these diseases, the um, Crimean Congo is a tick-borne arbovirus in uh, the uh, Bonia viridae family. <clears throat> the Lhasa is an arena virus transmitted through rats and exposure to the feces and urine. And then Ebola and Marburg are members of the Philoviridae family spread through direct contact with body fluids. Viruses are very long branch string-like organisms. Uh, and all these viruses um, are more likely to be transmitted through contact. Um, the others are pretty much arboviruses. Uh, now, some of you may remember that the media had a heyday with these ex so-called experts warning that Ebola was somehow going to become airborne and go across the ocean as an airborne disease, created more panic than it was worth, um, or somehow mosquitoes were going to pick it up and it was going to kill us all. Um, you know, that certainly would be a bad situation. The one we worry about is the Crimean Congo fever as a tick-borne disease and the area that it covers certainly has the most risk of that happening. Uh, I remember a phone call we received on um, Ebola with an individual here in our community wanting us to send all the Africans back home uh, because of the fear that all the Africans were gonna bring Ebola to Walmart and somehow walking through Mar Walmart spread this. And there was really no risk of that. Uh, but I'll tell you what, it opened up doors uh, and so God allowed me to be able to present a seminar to get everybody in the health community in Lynchburg up to snuff on Ebola uh, so that we had already done training. And I'm convinced that in Lynchburg, had we had a case of Ebola popped up, uh, we would have very quickly had it under control because everybody already knew how to control it, how to dress, how to uh, doff and don uh, equipment properly without putting themselves at risk. So. Let's go ahead and talk about the filoviridae. Um, case fatality rates from these vary from about 25 to 90 percent in most cases, incubation about two to 21 days, uh, related to how much viral load is actually presented at the beginning, as well as some other factors. Um, turns out that filoviridae um, have a natural host. They are zoonotic diseases that live in uh, fruit bats. Um, but other animals can pick it up from the bats. Uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, monkeys, antelopes, and porcupines all can acquire this disease and are often a predictor of outbreaks of human disease. So epidemiologically, it'd be nice to be looking at these animals in areas where primary care providers exist. And maybe we need to present that to our community health workers to think about looking at some of the other animals affected. Of course, the main means of spread for the filovator day are human-to-human -human transmission, and healthcare workers are often affected by this. Um, I've already mentioned um, the Ebola first outbreak. Marburg actually predates that. Um, Marburg was first recognized in cases in a laboratory setting brought in from monkeys from Uganda. Um, the first Ebola, um, in Central Africa, near those tropical rainforests. And then in the 2014, 2016 outbreak in West Africa, major urban uh, areas began to be affected. There's good evidence that uh, it was really the lack of control 
in the rural settings allowed this to come into the cities. And so we need to be able to think about how to have a package of interventions, uh, namely case management where the disease first arises, uh, to be able to get infection prevention and control and that surveillance so we can begin to uh, contact uh, our tra or trace our contacts and find ways to get good laboratory service readily available. Uh, we also have to think about the safe burial and social mobilization. And Samaritan's Purse learned this. Um, sometimes it was a little difficult, I think, going through the initial phases when the community was against everything, uh, even wanting to burn it, now, excuse me, blame the providers for what was happening. The success in Liberia actually hinged on uh, engaging local population <coughs> and particularly getting them to use PPE and um, the burial practices and then reporting those cases in a timely way so that uh, treatments could be started. And Lance could probably attest to this that early on, Everybody was so afraid they were keeping patients at home and taking care of them with no personal protection, and it actually fostered the spread of disease. Go on to the next slide. Um, this is the geographic distribution of the Marburg hemorrhagic fever uh, outbreaks and bats. Um, and the bats' natural habitat, which is the same as the bats that carry Ebola, or we believe it carry Ebola, uh, in through Africa and into uh, the southern part of Asia and even onto uh, the islands and into uh, Australia. These bats are, are known as a reservoir. Um, and Marburg, like I say, was first identified even a decade before Ebola. This map was created after the reservoir was first validated and the orange areas show places where there have been outbreaks. Notice that a lot of these are outside of the geographic distribution of the bat. In fact, notice we've had a case uh, here in the United States, uh, which is kind of interesting. I'll talk about that in a second. The dotted line, though, is the limit of the bat range. So it's conceivable we might see this disease reemerge through some of these areas. In fact, one of the outbreaks of Ebola occurred in the United States among monkeys that were brought in from uh, Philippines uh, as a research animal in Reston, Virginia. And so uh, a big, big concern there. Fortunately, that particular strain did not cause a lot of human disease. And we're still working to figure out what that is, which is part of the reason Ebola is still on this list. So here's a timeline on the next slide. Uh, looking at key events, of the case of Marburg in the United States. And this started in 2007, um, in December, a, a lady who's 44 years old, she had gone to Uganda, went on a safari trip for about two weeks. And on the Christmas day, she actually went to the Python cave to kind of conclude her uh, adventurous ways. Um, and then she returned at the end of the week. And so on January 4th, she reported to a physician, uh, her symptoms that in time included um, hemorrhagic manifestations. And so this physician ordered all the right tests, did all the right things. And on day seven, when the hemorrhagic symptoms first occurred, uh, having no answers, he went ahead and got testing for specific causes, including Marburg virus, which all came up negative. Uh, she got better eventually, uh, very heavy supportive care, and was discharged two weeks after admission. Uh, the fascinating part of this story, though, is that in July of 2008, so we're talking a, a year later, uh, she learned of a fatal case of Marburg hemorrhagic fever in a Dutch tourist. And as she read about it, uh, this tourist had actually visited the exact same python cave in Uganda. And so she went back to her primary care physician and requested further testing. And he was kind enough to indulge her in her request and it showed Marburg. Uh, so understanding how the antibody responses to these diseases is very important. And it, it is a matter of careful surveillance and it began to connect the dots epidemiologically for this disease. And 
a direct feed over to Ebola and what we understand now about Ebola. Um, now, sometimes it takes a good outbreak of disease to really have the laboratory to study uh, the disease. And so we have a number of advances that came up as a direct result of this huge outbreak uh, in West Africa. We now have a broad range of, of blood, immunologic, and drug therapies that are under development. Uh, Lance had the opportunity to use ZMAP, uh, and we know that it did reduce mortality by 40% when it could be used. I have no idea how many doses were actually given out. I know when Lance picked up his first uh, three doses, it was enough for one patient, and there were four uh, courses of therapy in the entire world at that time. Um, you know, one can only wonder. Um, and then we have now a vaccine that's been developed and in a trial in Guinea, uh, that was 100% effective. Mm -hmm. The question though is when do you give the virus and, or the vaccine for this virus and how do you do it? Uh, it would it be 100% effective if we just gave it to the general population or was it the way that we were using it? And those questions all remain to be answered. Uh, the way that the vaccine trial was done was they identified a new case after the main part of the epidemic was over, looking for those secondary outbreaks. And they would vaccinate everybody around the circle where that person could potentially have exposed another person. And if they saw any cases pop up, then they would go around that person and so forth. Well, as it turns out, they never had to go out to widening circles because it was 100% effective amongst those that were vaccinated. Amongst those that didn't receive the vaccine, they certainly saw cases, and then they re-implemented uh, this vaccine circle trials, and again showed it 100% of effective. So, very good vaccine, and uh, we'll see how that develops over time, and how we use that. Should we see another outbreak, and we probably will. Um, okay, I mentioned loss of fever already, um, and loss of fever can look all the world like Ebola. And it is an old world arena virus. Um, there are a couple dozen of these actually known globally. And most of you are probably unaware that there are at least 18 here in the New York uh, world. Um, in fact, each of these viruses has its own rodent species as a host. The rodents typically don't get sick. Um, and it's the rodent feces and urines that pass it on. In the case of Lassa fever, is the mastomus rats. Um, and these rats, like I said, don't get sick. But once an individual is sick, then person to person spread is possible. Now, overall, the fatality, fatality rate is only about 1%. So I think this is kind of the, the pipe dream of those that were claiming the Ebola in West Africa was actually Lhasa because we see people die from it, but very, very few. Um, in fact, 80% of people with Lhasa fever are totally asymptomatic. And I had an opportunity to deal with this disease when I visited Sierra Leone during their civil war uh, a couple decades ago. Um, immunotherapy using donated blood has been used and has treated ill patients fairly effectively. Uh, we also now know that ribavirin is generally effective when treating Lassa fever and other arena viruses, not so good for the filoviruses. Um, and one of the other concerns with loss of fever is the risk of miscarriage from infection. Um, and so I suspect the interest in this disease actually stems from the crossover in the um, epidemiologic range of these two diseases. And even though there's a low mortality rate, it'd be nice if we could recognize Lhasa much quickly and allow uh, awareness of the presence of Ebola much more quickly for future outbreaks. And again, need to make sure the public health uh, includes the community health workers and those low resource primary care providers in the bush. Okay, moving on, um, we've already talked a little about Crimea Congo. Uh, it is a hemorrhagic fever and the Bunyer Viridae include the Rift Valley fever and also the severe uh, fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome. And these viruses uh, are collectively known as arboviruses, one of the major groups of arboviruses. Uh, they're transmitted by arthropods. Um, and in fact, the word arbovirus originally came from the acronym, 
uh, the AR from arthropod, the BO from born, and then virus. Uh, many of these are zoonotic. Um, they spread to people uh, incidentally when people come into contact with the animal habitats. So urbanization, adventuring uh, is a factor in that. Uh, yellow fever, dengue, chikungunya, Zika are also arboviruses and the same sort of epidemiology is involved. Okay, Crimea Congo fever has a case fatality of 30 to 40 percent, so very similar to Ebola. Um, ribavirin is again very helpful for this, particularly if treated early. Uh, primarily transmitted from a tick um, and human-human transmission through body fluids, so very much like Ebola. Uh, infected livestock can also transmit the disease. Uh, the tick range actually is very large uh, in countries below the 50th parallel north. Um, so the endemic areas include Africa, the Balkans, the Middle East, and Asia, and there is no vaccine for this. Um, Curiously, um, we first identified this disease in 1944 in Crimea, part of the, the Ukraine. Uh, the same illness appeared in Congo in 1956, but the virus wasn't identified and isolated until 1969. And so since it was linked with both diseases, uh, both uh, regions were applied to the disease name. If I can move to the next slide, we can actually see the range of the tick and the areas where this disease has occurred. Uh, the red depicts where there have been more than 50 case reports, the orange where there have been like 5 to 49 cases, the bright yellow uh, countries with serologic evidence of disease and the presence of the vector, and the pale yellow areas where the tick is found, but we've yet to see an outbreak. And so we might expect through the tick picking up this disease from livestock or other animals, it could be introduced to uh, human populations, particularly those who work in agriculture and have close dealings with the livestock. Okay, moving on. Rift Valley fever, and I told you, we're gonna hit a lot of diseases really quickly, um, just so people are aware. Uh, Rift Valley fever, also an arbovirus. Uh, most human infections are from contact with blood organs of infected animals. Uh, the human infections can also follow bites from infected mosquitoes in this case. Um, there has not been any human-to-human -human, uh, case transmission that we've been able to document. Uh, incubation period, though, is about two to six days, which is a fairly common time period for these uh, particular diseases. Uh, there is an animal vaccination program that's very useful for preventing disease in animals but there is no commercially available human vaccine. So we'd like to see about getting that developed. Uh, typically, it's a mild fever syndrome with sudden onset of a flu-like uh, illness, muscle aches, pains, the headache. Uh, easy to brush off is just the flu. Um, and fortunately, serious disease is uncommon, but we can see ocular disease, um, meningococcal, or excuse me, meningoencephalitis disease, um, and then hemorrhagic fever in less than 1% of patients. Um, but, but unfortunately, if you're one of the 1%, you could care less about the epidemiology. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it goes, right, Lance? Yes. yes. All right. Severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome, uh, first identified in China. So this is a new one, uh, 2010, and then additional cases in South Korea and Japan in 2013. This is a brand new uh, bunyan virus. Um, and it is also transmitted by a tick vector. Um, and it turns out that this original tick vector is not the only tick that can carry the disease. Uh, and again, the risk is where there's interaction with animals, people that are in rural areas, farmers, forest workers, agricultural workers. And like with some of the other hemorrhagic fevers, if you develop that set of symptoms, uh, fatality rate is about 30%. We really don't understand in this particular disease, because it's so new, how the pathophysiology actually works. And again, that's why it's on the list. We're trying to work through this. And the rapid rise of this from 2010 to 2013 is a little bit worrisome. Um, could this be the next hemorrhagic fever that we really have to deal with? Uh, chikungunya, some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, I love actually saying it. There are a few words that I love. 
Chikungunya is one of them. My my other favorite is from uh, Guatemala. There's a town, uh, Chiquimula. Uh, just something about saying that word makes me happy. Uh, having this disease, not so much. Uh, I have actually had a number of patients and friends who've had this disease. Uh, they say that the headache that follows the initial symptoms can last for weeks, sometimes months, and it's horrendous. Um, the name of the virus, of course, is derived from the place where it was first uh, occurring. It's an African dialect in Swahili, uh, the Makande uh, language. It translates as to be bent over. And I'll, I'll tell you from having treated these patients, they look like they just want to curl up in a ball and just die right there. Uh, I've been watching this virus through the 90s as outbreaks occurred in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Australia, and onto some of the islands in India and the Pacific. And when it came to our neck of the woods in 2013, I was really, really concerned about it. Um, there's a fun song, if you have time. Uh, Jamaican entertainer Wayne Jay wrote this song to raise public awareness uh, two or three years ago. And the song can be summarized as, don't let the mosquito bite, and if it does, take two Panadol, because it's all we got to offer you. Um, and it, you can find it on YouTube. I think his advice is as good as any physician or any public health worker could offer. Uh, there is no vaccine. Um, there's a question of do symptoms relate to the dengue since both are kind of in the same grouping of diseases. Um, and does one increase the risk of the other's symptoms? And we don't know the answers to that. Um, but for right now, travelers need to just protect themselves with insect repellent, long sleeves, and pants, and stay in place with air conditioning. Uh, that use uh, door screens and window screens. Uh, I, I've only traveled once without my mosquito net. It's always in my suitcase now. Uh, I actually had dengue fever when I was in Sierra Leone. I was told I'd be in a four-star hotel. It was one of those places that didn't have screens on the windows. Uh, it had one light bulb. That was one star. Had a lock on the door. That was two stars. <laughs> had a toilet. You had to reach into the back of the tank to pull up the uh, lever so you could flush it. But there was a toilet that says three stars, and there was a bed with about a quarter-inch mattress. Um, and that was the extent. So it got four stars, uh, and I got dengue fever out of it. Um, <laughs> and Lance, you've been a few of those places too, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, the most common symptoms with chikungunya are the fever and the joint pain, other symptoms, the headache, the muscle pain, the rashes. And uh, again, it does go quickly into new areas. Um, and so... We have had a little bit of chikungunya here in the United States. Uh, to date, most of these cases have been imported. Um, and so you got to follow the trend of emerging diseases looking at the incidence rate. With all infectious diseases, uh, in incidence rate is really what we watch. And so I'm watching the incidence of both Zika and chikungunya uh, in Florida, in Texas, in Puerto Rico. Um, where we've seen disease in the past and looking to see if it increases. In fact, if I can go to the next slide, uh, here's a map that was created for Zika outbreaks in the United States uh, looking at July risk. The primary for vector for chikungunya and Zika are is actually the same, Aedes aegypti. The secondary vector, Aedes autopictus. Um, the current range for Aedes aegypti on this map is indicated in the gray. And the historic range is indicated by that red dotted line. Um, so we could have that primary vector in areas oh, like Boone, North Carolina, uh, <laughs> or Lynchburg, Virginia. And in fact, if you add in the secondary vector, uh, the Aedes autopictus on the green line, we actually have about half the United States covered. Um, and so this map accurately predicted the potential for Zika in the United States in 2016. Uh, and sure enough, that blue arrow down there pointing at Miami, a large population of people with the vector and with the immigrant population coming in from areas already infected, uh, we saw outbreaks in, tech, in, um, in Florida in the Miami area. And you're probably all familiar with that and probably follow that on the news, so I won't go into details. Um, in fact, here's a map from September showing cases of Zika um, frequency by state. And we can use those case reports to actually calculate incidence rates and get an idea. 
And here you look at Zika and you see Texas in the dark blue, you see Florida in a dark blue, and you see Puerto Rico with the hash mark indicate that it's already endemic there. Uh, we will see more of that. And this year for the first time, we've actually had local transmission of Zika already. And so again, very worrisome. Uh, and we'll be watching it. Okay. Of course, the reason we watch the Zika in particular is the congenital abnormalities. Um, now, Zika has been with us for a long time. In fact, Zika was originally identified in 1947. Uh, it was found in monkeys, so it's another zoonosis uh, in the Zika forest of Uganda, and hence the name. Um, and later, we found out that there were a lot of people that actually had antibodies against this virus in many parts of Africa. Um, it's known to cause a rash and fever in some people, but generally it was considered fairly benign and even unimportant until 2013, um, when the first Zika cases were reported in Tahiti. Now, 80% of those were asymptomatic. In fact, globally, 80% of the cases are asymptomatic. And that's probably why it wasn't on anybody's radar. Yeah, consider if you're a child and you get this in Africa, uh, where in Uganda, where it naturally occurs, 80% um, of kids wouldn't have any symptoms. Kid gets a rash, you blow it off as another type of rash, and it's no consequence because little kids aren't getting pregnant. Um, but when it got to Tahiti, people had no immunity. And even though 80% of the cases were asymptomatic, some of the people that picked it up were pregnant women. In fact, there were 13 cases of fetal cerebral abnormalities out of about 4,000 births. Normally, we would expect about one, maybe two out of 10,000 births. So this is fairly significant. Um, and by the end of 2015, there were 28,000 cases of Zika in Tahiti. And we were already beginning to be concerned, is this something we have to be looking at? And what if this gets to a largely populated area with more population than 28,000? And so we had the opportunity to look at that a year later in Brazil. Uh, it was imported through either the international canoeing event or through World Cup into Brazil and rapidly spread in through the country. There were over a million cases and we began to see large numbers of microcephaly. In fact, I believe it went up about 100 fold. Uh, and they were going with a case definition of three standard deviations from the norm for head circumference. Uh, so fairly significant. It wasn't that they just redefined it and made it easy to diagnose. And here's the microcephaly that they were seeing. Uh, so the question is still, uh, why? Uh, why is this an issue for the unborn? Did the virus mutate? Is it complications that are just a matter of timing? Um, but it's had a huge impact in my personal practice. Uh, women going on short-term trips, I now need to advise these young ladies uh, to delay pregnancy for at least six months. In fact, I need to even advise guys who are thinking about getting married and coming back to the States and might impregnate uh, a new wife, say. Um, it's an issue. Uh, in fact, I've consulted with a couple women here in the last few months uh, one actually arrived from a Latin American country uh, to the Washington, D.C. area uh, and came here primarily so that she would have care for her baby because she was so worried about Zika. And in fact, she tested positive and she was going for her ultrasound when I saw her uh, to determine whether the baby had microcephaly and what to do about that. Um, she had little comprehension of English and very afraid about the child, and it was an opportunity to step into her life. Uh, fortunately, no sequelae, she did fine. Uh, and again, timing everything. Uh, I had another woman from South Florida uh, whose husband was working in geology, went into the very neighborhood where Zika outbreak occurred, and she at the time was six months pregnant and worried, do I have to worry about my baby? He came home. And unfortunately, providers in her area said, well, we don't think it's an issue because you're not where there's a mosquito. They didn't know about the sexual transmission and the risk that he actually did pose to her. And in fact, one of them actually made a comment. Well, he was only there during the daytime, so you don't have to worry about it. Except Aedes aegypti and Aedes autopictus are daytime biters, so she did need to worry about it. Uh, we were able to convince the Florida Health Department to actually test her husband 
even though it was outside the protocol because of her risk uh, and spreading to a new geographic area and he tested negative. So that's a good thing. Uh, so good outcomes from there. Unfortunately, uh, some others not so good. Uh, I'm come back to uh, Colorado again. Uh, our very first imported case of Zika on the next slide here is 2008 into Colorado uh, from Senegal. And it's an interesting story because there were two researchers looking at malaria mosquitoes. And so they were trying to not avoid uh, malaria or malaria uh, mosquito bites and other mosquito bites. And both of them developed rashes. And when the one fellow returned home uh, weeks later, he actually transmitted Zika to his wife. She got the exact same rash. Um, they tested her for all the normal viruses and nothing came up. It was a year later when his research assistant went back to Senegal and was sitting down at a table and said, hey, I had this rash the last time I was here. And the fellow at the table laughed at him and said, it sounds like Zika virus. Um, my father actually discovered that back in 47. They tested this woman specifically for Zika. They tested both of those researchers for Zika and found out it was Zika virus. Uh, so again, if you don't have that awareness, you don't get the testing um, and uh, you go from there. All right, run right along. I think we've got just a couple more viruses here to go through. So we'll move on to the coronaviruses. Uh, again, structure very similar to common cold and like common cold, they're well adapted for respiratory transmission and resulting disease, but the consequence is much more serious. And of course, I'm talking about SARS and uh, MERS. Uh, SARS, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, and MERS, Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome. SARS started in 2003 in China uh, in a marketplace, probably acquired uh, as this worker went then, a businessman to Hong Kong. Uh, he developed symptoms, transmitted to his physician, and both he and the physician died of the disease. Uh, within weeks, this was global in its distribution because of the human-human transmission. Um, I put a picture on here that I borrowed uh, from a coffee website. Uh, Palm Civet Cat is actually a, a reservoir for this. Um, other animals in the Chinese market and in restaurants can also be a reservoir. Um, newer genetic evidence actually, though, suggests that the bat is the natural reservoir. Uh, so fruit bats, again, implement it. Um, with SARS, there were over 8,000 cases, 774 deaths. So this is fairly significant. It's not just the flu. Uh, it's something different, something more profound. Uh, kind of story about civet cats. Uh, if you ever go for expensive coffee, the civet cat uh, eats uh, coffee cherries and digests the cherry, but passes the, uh, the bean, the seed portion, through the stool. Uh, back in colonial times, all the coffee beans were transmitted or transferred to the European markets, and the locals uh, in Indonesia could not use the coffee for themselves. So they went around and started picking up the uh, beans from the civet cat defecation. And in doing so, uh, they were able to extract the beans to make coffee. Um, that coffee is now the most expensive in the world, the Kopi Luka coffee and became known to Dutch uh, farmers and uh, you can now buy it. Hmm, <laughs> half the question, is that a risky food? Uh, well, good news is coffee we cook at really high temperatures and probably not an issue. So you can drink your coffee. Um, some of these other foods, not so uh, safe and certainly the risk for cross-contamination occurs. Um, with MERS, um, Middle Eastern syndrome, uh, first arose in 2013, and our feeling was, ah, we've got another one. Ended up with about a 35% mortality rate. A lot of asymptomatic cases, which certainly is a concern. Uh, and I always hate these people that's like, I never get the flu. Oh, no, you're asymptomatic. You're transferring it to the rest of us. Um, <laughs> get the shot, please. Uh, for most of these cases, there are human-human transmissions. It does require close contact, about three feet. And camels serve as a reservoir for it. So the high risk might come from contact with the camel directly or from raw or undercooked animal products, including milk and the meat. And fortunately, we were much more prepared for MERS and SARS, and uh, we didn't have to shut down airports in Toronto. All right. And so I think we're moving to our final 
virus, and that is the NIFA, which most of you have probably never heard of, uh, first identified in uh, Malaysia in 98. Uh, pigs were the immediate host in that particular outbreak. But in 2014, there was another outbreak with humans being infected with the Nipah virus. Um, and it resulted from uh, consuming the date palm sap. Um, and it turns out the bats were uh, roosting in the trees, uh, dropping their feces onto the sap. And as the sap was collected, it had the virus uh, contamination. Uh, begins with headache and fever, respiratory symptoms fairly common, uh, progresses then to coma and respiratory suppression and death with a mortality rate of at least 40%. And again, bats, I don't know why bats are suddenly becoming an issue, and it's probably because we're invading their territory. Uh, we're, we're choosing the same foods that they eat. All right, well, we started out with flu, so I'm going to come back to something very contemporary. I said the flu wasn't on the watch list. Uh, but it is because there's another program for that. September of this year, human infection with avian uh, influenza and H7, H9 virus in China. Uh, to date, since 2013, there have been over 1,500 cases. Um, some of these confirmed by lab. Uh, but the outbreak from in September, uh, August time frame, um, the initial person died from poultry exposure. Uh, a week or so later, two more cases, severe condition. One had poultry exposure, the other did not. Uh, in September 4th, um, there was an individual who died that had no poultry exposure. And so this becomes a real concern. Uh, and again, public health surveillance is a continuous systematic collection and analysis of data. And it allows us then to look at that data from various sources and then we can respond. But the data is only as good as reports from the field. So as primary care physicians, we need to make sure we're reporting. Uh, we need to make sure that those that are working as community health workers understand and also report it. Uh, it's up to a community to take part in this and to prepare. And with that, uh, I think I'm ready for whatever questions are thrown here. I think we've got, what, about eight or 10 minutes, Lance? Uh yeah, we've got a few minutes here. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, uh, an awesome presentation, and uh, I think you've uh, provoked some interest here. Um, Dr. Alan Sawyer um, poses the first question. He says, when working in developing countries, uh, when faced with atypical presentation of febrile patients with unexplained infections, how can we best uh, evaluate for a suspected emerging infectious and, disease? And, and that's a really good question. And the first thing is say, this looks different. Mm -hmm. um, much like Dr. Miner did, this is different. And to his credit, he actually reported it to the health authorities in 1918. Of course, health departments were just coming into being. Um, I've actually run into a similar situation just last week uh, with something that resembles polio in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. I actually had a call, uh, one of our public health students online said, yeah, can you come to Cameroon and help us with polio? And I'm like, uh, polio in Cameroon, I think we've pretty much eliminated. What are you seeing? And he says, well, somebody said that they were seeing this neurologic condition that looks like polio. And did you, he report it? And the answer was no. Uh, and so I directed him how to make that happen. And mm -hmm. usually you go through the country authorities. And I think it's important to have those relationships as you develop clinics and community health worker uh, programs to have a reporting mechanism as part of that training so the the state, the uh, national government is aware and just we're seeing something different. And I treat every disease as though it could be less than just the flu. Right. I remember one of my professors in med school said, I assume everything is subacute bacterial endocarditis until proven otherwise. <laughs> Probably a little bit overkill. Um, but there's some truth to that. If you're seeing something that looks bad and looks different, I don't want to have the bad. I'm going to use personal protective equipment, uh, not necessarily gown up and have uh, this, the whole biohazard suit, but certainly use gloves and use a mask for respiratory things to right. prevent disease. And then get samples to the appropriate lab so they can be reported. And of course, every government has a regional uh, World Health Organization office that they report to, and they'll help monitor that, and it will help mobilize those resources that uh, Colleen covered so well uh, last mm -hmm. month. 
Yeah. No, uh, those are great points. Yeah, I think um, just to add to that, um, you certainly have to have a, a very, just maintain a very high index of suspicion. Um, you know, be well read with uh, these emerging infections. Um, you know, just go back uh, case in point uh, with the Ebola outbreak, you know, they isolated the index case um, uh, in Guinea. Um, it was in December of 2013, uh, but they didn't actually recognize Ebola for Ebola until about March. Right. Um, so you really just have to, you know, keep a high index of suspicion. If you see anything, like especially just to give an example with like viral hemorrhagic fevers, you know, if they have some unusual bleeding, um, Alan, in your case, if they have like spontaneous abortion and it's unexplained, you know, that's a, uh, a certainly can happen with hemorrhagic fevers. So I think we just right. have to as um, Dr. Lane said, just um, be vigilant and um, and then as best you can, don't be, I think, over uh, cautious, but, you know, gloves and a mask um, and, you know, and just caution, it goes a long ways. Right. And certainly if you are exposed to any body fluids, wash yourself immediately. Yes. Um, and it's surprising to me how many physicians I see in hospitals that do not wash their hands. Mm hmm you're you know, right. Amen. Nurses don't wash their hands. It drives me bananas. Yeah. And I become the hand washing Nazi. I mean, literally grab people by a scruff of the neck. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Rich, uh, the, uh, Alan also makes a comment that uh, Zika, um, uh, with, with the uh, infection, there's still a low rate, a relatively low rate of uh, right. fetal uh, cerebral right. uh, abnormalities following that infection. Right. But there seems to be uh, overemphasis on termination of pregnancy as treatment. Yeah. That doesn't yeah. make sense. And it doesn't make sense to me either. I was actually consulted by the Honduran government uh, last year, the year before, as we started to see this uh, occur in 2015. Um, and their concern was it is illegal to do an abortion in Honduras, as many Catholic countries. And some political leaders were actually looking at promoting abortion as a control mechanism, uh, worried about their budgets. And so we had a very large discussion on risk to benefit and what we were looking at and how a more appropriate way to deal with Zika was actually to deal with the mosquitoes, not with the pregnancy outcomes, uh, because most women do perfectly fine. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, um, so our, our good friends from CCIH are with us today. Uh, Kathy Erb asks, uh, do you have uh, experience with churches being involved in education efforts uh, on some of those more recent infectious diseases? Well, that's a good question. And I don't have any direct um, involvement with churches that have done educational programs, um, though I will say the Honduran experience actually came to me through Campus Crusade for Christ. Um, I've worked down there doing AIDS prevention uh, seminars for years, and one of the people I trained actually contacted me and said, can you work with the, these political leaders and give them information? Um, so Christians certainly can get involved in this, and they should. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating is that young lady is not a healthcare provider at all. Uh, in fact, she's not even a teacher. Uh, she was trained as a bookkeeper. And she just developed this natural interest in yeah. HIV prevention mm -hmm. and now works with AIDS patients uh, fairly regularly and educational and right. creating that interface with the church. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's an incredibly relevant question, um, Kathy. Um, if uh, if you go back and, uh, Rich, if you'll uh, look at the uh, 11 um, uh, diseases um, that uh, WHO is um, mostly concerned with. Um, if you break it down, um, there there's really there's three categories. There's right. tick-borne, or I should say, arthropod arthropod vector. There's airborne, um, and then there's viral hemorrhagic right. fevers. All three of those really um, to manage them really require public health interventions. Right. The church is global and uh, would provide an amazing uh, public health network to implement some of those uh, needed uh, public health interventions. Yeah, and I would agree that church should get involved in doing this type of thing. Um, so often when I've done missions work, uh, people want me to come and do clinics. I think we can actually get much more mileage by preventing the diseases in the first place. Mm -hmm. And if the church enables us to do that, then so be it. 
Now, I've worked with Kathy up at CCIH a lot. Um, I've actually done a presentation up there on promoting vaccinations through the church. Uh, and I've made a pitch for that on several occasions um, because I think we need to raise that awareness on where vaccines are Im important as a control mechanism and what the truth and the fiction is on, on vaccines because uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. You're right, yes. Um, I am looking at our last question um, from Skip Roy, um, our good friend, the physical therapist. Um, let's see, I'm not sure. Uh, it says, how much of a terrorist do you recommend we be in mission hospitals where hand washing doesn't seem to be a part of the culture? It should be part of the culture. <laughs> we should have hand washing as just an everyday practice. And I think we need to enforce that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it goes without saying, yeah, yeah, you're going to be the first one to get sick. And if not, it's going to be one of your patients. Yeah. And um, I'm waiting for a few lawsuits in the U.S. to come up over the whole idea of uh, I got this because somebody didn't wash their hands. Yeah. Um, and, and it will happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no question. I mean, we I mean, uh, that's one of the more common modes of transmission of infectious disease. Um, yeah. I mean, if you just um, think about. Um, uh, well, uh, in actually, actually, Dallas, the case there, um, two nurses picked it up because they lacked the training. Good point. And I, I don't think it was that they weren't trained. They just weren't practiced in it. And it was probably doffing their equipment. They just contaminated hands and then didn't wash immediately and infected themselves. You're right. That's a great point. And, um, and that hospital will suffer traumatic <laughs> financial loss because of those lawsuits coming from that. Absolutely. Another uh, disease that comes to my mind is uh, C. diff colitis. I mean, yeah. um, that's critical. Hand washing is incredibly critical there. So um, very good point. So Skip, yeah. uh, we think you should uh, also be a hand washing Nazi and, and uh, um, really emphasize that as we serve in these mission hospitals. Can we make buttons that say, have you washed your hands today? And then we don't have to say anything. <laughs> Exactly. Very good. Well, um, Dr. Lane, I think uh, at least that's all the questions that I okay. see um, uh, on the uh, chat box there. Um, thank you again for a phenomenal presentation Certainly. on uh, emerging uh, infections. Uh, really uh, is just a, of growing importance. I um, want to remind um, our viewers there that uh, CME credit is available uh, for this session. The form and instructions are in your email. Uh, and we will be sending a follow-up email with the link to this recording. Um, if you're not on the email list, you can join the forum uh, at health.samaritanspurse.org. Um, and uh, you can be the first to know about upcoming events. Next month, um, it will be November the 8th uh, on Wednesday, 12 uh, noon Eastern Standard Time. Uh, once again, we'll have our uh, good friend, Dr. Linda Mabula um, uh, from USAID, uh, who's also on faculty at uh, Johns Hopkins. We'll be presenting uh, treating non-communicable disease uh, in disasters. Uh, and so with that, we uh, conclude. Thank you again for joining us. Um, have a great rest of the week.